after d4, d5, c4, knight c6, the Chigorian defense is on the board. In this video, we're going to go through e3. We saw a few lines in one of the previous videos. We're going to go on now and explore something new. Now, as we remember from the previous video that went through the topic of the e3, early e3 move, black plays e5, thematic move. And after pawn takes, we push the pawn. We're down a pawn and white might simply go up another pawn, well, just for the moment, because then we're going to take back with the queen. Now, I'm going to go through two other variations, knight f3 being played now, it's a weird move, but it's pretty annoying, and another one where white plays knight f3 one move before. In this video, we're going to go through this one still. Okay, so in the previous videos, we went through queen takes, then knight takes, and everything that happens next, it was a crazy game. In this video, we're going to go through knight f3, it's a pretty annoying move that I encounter a lot. White purposely gives up the castling idea. Because, well, you know that what you know what happens after queen takes queen, knight takes back, it's going to be the threat in c2. For more information, go and look at the other video I made that talks about it extensively. It's certainly much better for black. So after knight f3, white wants to keep the pawn advantage in exchange of the castling right. And anyway, queen takes, king takes, bishop f5. The white player might think of playing bishop f4 to defend this pawn or simply keep the knight in f3 protecting the pawn. White might try to induce us to play a move like bishop to g4, pinning the knight so that we can take this, but then we'd be giving up the bishop pair for nothing, because yes, we might take this pawn and so on, but then White will, let, will be left to play an open end game with the bishop pair, and that's not good. So let's not fall for that. Bishop f5 is the best move. Cuts off this in very important diagonal where the White King might try to hide later on. So after developing move bishop to e3, cut comes with check. Three options we're going to look at king e1, king c1, and knight d2. Well, king to c2 is not possible, so king e2 is just bad because you're blocking your own bishop. Black goes on with knight h6 in that case. Let's just look at very, very briefly at this line. The idea now is simply to play knight h6 with an attack on this bishop, and then play knight c takes the pawn, bishop e6, and double pressure over the pawn in c4. That's the plan we're going for. If white plays h3, stopping that from happening, you play bishop e6, you're threatening to take this pawn, so it will be a very strong move. And there's the thematic moves. If the king goes down for the bishop to protect this pawn, you have ideas of knight b4, threatening knight c2 would check, winning the rook. And in this, this type of move, when, they, when it's blocked, with the knight in a3, we can just play knight to d3, forcing a swap of bishop, winning the pawn in b2. And it's thematic. You, you're all supposed to, to be very good at this if you're a Chigorin player. But let's look at the correct line. Knight b4, threatening knight c2. Knight a3, stopping that. Also, this knight cannot be kicked out because a3 cannot push to attack the knight. So black now simply plays knight a5. It's not necessary to do that move immediately. Knight f5, threatening to double up and isolate the pawn of our opponent. Bishop f4 means we can play knight d3 and force a swap of bishop because we're threatening to win the bishop in f4 for free. So if white tries something like rook to d1, trying to calm down the initiative that we have, look how well placed our pieces are. Simply rook takes, king takes, and now we take the bishop. Pawn takes back, this pawn is doubled up and isolated. We simply develop the bishop to e7. We're going to play the end game with a better pawn structure and the bishop pair. We're also attacking the pawn in a2 with the knight. So if white player tries to play g4, considering that this bishop will have a much better place from the fianchetto rather than from any of these squares like e2 or d3. Let's conclude the line with rook to d8, showing how fluid the development is. King e2 simply goes to d3, attacking the pawn. You also have a threat of taking the knight, which is the defender of c4. Then you can play bishop c4, is completely winning. Position evaluated around minus 4 or something like that. If white develop and ignores the pawn, then just take this one and we're going to have an attack on the knight, an attack here. Again, position evaluated around minus 5 at this point. So let's not hang around this line. Let's go to the more serious line. So in this position, we just castled longside and gave a check to the king. We don't notice how some, some moves are just impossible. So let's look at king e1 immediately. Remember, in this game, where they play this variation, this c4 pawn is kind of a problem for the development of this bishop. Knight h6 comes now. And let's look at this move now. a3. This is a scenario that needs to be met because you're probably wondering, okay, this a3 move will is multi-purpose. So first of all, it encourages to play b4, b5, and then start pushing the pawn against the king side. The rook will be in an open file. Also, most importantly, stops our knight from going to b4, where it's going to be a very strong knight, and stops also potential checks of the bishop. So a3 is met with knight g4. So earlier we went through the idea of h3 stopping knight g4. But in this case, white played a3, okay, then we're going to play knight g4. The knight is just the strongest piece on the board. 
And now we're threatening to play knight e3, that could be an idea. If white retreats, the bishop tries to save it. Either way, it wouldn't have worked because you could play bishop c5 now, and this is a threat that cannot be stopped. You're going to win a pawn no matter what. And by the way, in this position, white can't just play bishop f4 in order to play bishop g3 to put extra defense to the pawn in f2 and also to safeguard the bishop pair because bishop c5 comes anyway, you're making that threat, and now bishop g3, it looks like white is holding both the bishop pair and the pawn in f2, and, but still, now you can just win this pawn. It's crucial pawn. You're threatening an uh, entire disaster. Position evaluated around minus 450. You're threatening rookie a, discover checks, knight d3. Everything is available to you. And this is not a free piece. Knight takes. You might argue that white is defending it well, but obviously you can just pin this and then play f6 potentially. In this position, let's go through knight c3. White will have to give up this bishop. Black continues with g6. No need to take the bishop now because we would still be threatening bishop c5. Never play a move if you're not being provoked. If white plays h3, for example, then now black simply plays knight takes e5. The reason is simple. We don't have to go and smash the pawn structure of our opponent because we're simply winning here. Our development is so much better. If white tries to continue developing, they say bishop to e2, this loses to knight to d3. You're going to be taking the pawn in d2, and then with an attack on the pawn in c4, you're going to be taking the pawn in d b2, this bishop is about to become a monster. If bishop takes knight instead of playing with the bishop pair, bishop d3 with an attack on this pawn, bishop g7 is coming. Again, it's winning for black. And just a move ago, if white takes the knight, then we simply take back. It's just too strong. We've got the same threats. Let's look at this type of idea. Bishop g5 attacking the rook. How do we meet this? Rook to e8, threatening this cover check. White can't just block it because then we will win the pawn in c4. It's going to be a disaster. And king to d2, for instance, is met with f6. When the bishop moves away, this bishop will come into play. If the bishop goes to h4, you've got an idea like bishop h6. It's a fantastic position. If the bishop goes on this diagonal, then you've got rook check. The bishop is coming into play. The other rook as well, soon enough. Again, these are all positions where, like, if I'm closing the line, that's because the position is evaluated around minus 4, minus 5, or something like that. So let's go on now to the next. Let's make a recap, actually. d4, d5, c4, knight, c6. e3, early e3 move is met, is met with e5, as you remember from the previous video. Pawn takes, d4. Pawn takes with two pawns down, but then we take back. And in the variation where they play knight f3, you take the queen. King takes back, and now bishop to f5. After bishop e3 developing, and long castle with check, what happens after king to c1? Well, okay, g6. We're going to have to start putting pressure over this pawn so that we can actually recapture it. Ah, so after, let's say, bishop e2 developing, bishop g7, and rook to d1. It looks like in this game, this type of variation, the wild player might be able to actually play a normal game. But still, rook takes, king takes, knight g to e7. We're about to finish development completely. And after bishop to f4 defending the pawn, it looks like we really can't take this pawn because it's well defended. But black simply plays knight to b4. Why? Now it's clear why the bishop is placed in f5 and not pinning the knight. Two thematic ideas. If white plays knight a3 in this position, black plays knight to c6. This knight is there to stay. It can't move because then the control of the square c2 will be lost. Well, let's see how to meet this move. I'm sure you're all thinking about knight h4 here. Doesn't this remove the bishop? Well, no, because you play bishop e4. Keep the bishop on this incredible diagonal. And now either f3 or bishop f3, you still play rook to d8 check. If king moves to e1, then bishop to d3 will do the job. Bishop can't take because knight d3 will recapture the piece and win the bishop. We're also threatening to finally take the pawn in e5. It all goes down to win a crucial pawn. So let's see what happens d1, trying to trade everything and even go to a winning end game for white, but that's not going to happen. Knight e5 recaptures the pawn that we've lost with an incredible position. If bishop takes, then we take back. And after bishop takes, knight takes, king e2. And after moving the knight to f4 check, the king will have to stick around the rook. But even after a swap, then bishop to b2, you're going to winning endgame. Open endgame with the bishop against the knight and an extra pawn. And white will have two isolated pawns. Position evaluated around minus 5. Oh, and in this position, if instead of f3, white plays bishop f3, giving an extra space for the king, it doesn't make much difference. Rook d8 anyway. Let's look at this type of idea. Bishop to d2. Blocking like that. 
is simply met with bishop to h6, it's game over. Let's do another recap so that it becomes easier to understand. e3, e5. Take, and you push the pawn, just ignore it. Take, you two pawns down, but then you take back. Knight f3 now, okay. Queen takes, king takes, bishop f5. And after bishop e3, castle with check, and we're going through the line, king to c1. Okay, this is met with g6, we're going to be putting pressure on e5. Bishop e2 development, bishop g7. Rook d1, we take, take. And now knight g2 e7, and we're about to finish development, and after bishop to f4, defending this pawn, see if white can take the pawn advantage, we play knight to b4. Earlier we went through knight a3, what happens after knight to c3, more normal move, maybe with the idea of being able to play rook c1, a3 attacking the knight, kicking that away, play b4, and play a normal game. We still give a check, and after, of course, of course king c1, king e1 is not possible because knight c2 wins, so king c1, and now we move the other knight to c6. Now, a3, I'm not going to go through a3 now, but I'll tell you, uh, if a3 comes, you can still play knight d3. So, let's go through this move, because I want to show also this type of idea, h3 with the idea of g4, trapping the bishop, or forcing it at least to go backwards, removing it from this incredible diagonal. Either way, even if you get provoked with a3, either way you can play knight d3 is the best move now, you're forking these two, and so the bishop is forced to take you, rook takes back, we're putting pressure on, we're putting pressure on this knight, the rook is defended, and a move like b3 is not, is not possible. The fact that b3 is not possible means we're going to be putting pressure on c4. So, for example, knight h4 attacking the bishop, you play bishop e6. You're attacking this pawn. You're also threatening h6, g5. And white cannot really play king to c2, attacking the rook, because knight to b4 saves the rook and checks the king. So it's a bit of a joke. The last line we're going to look at is after the long castle and the check on the king. We looked at what happens when the king moves. If knight to d2, going on with development... We go on with development knight to g7, the idea of going to g6. So let's say a3 now with the idea of b2, b5, and the rook being able to maybe do something in this game because it never does anything. Knight to g6, and now we have double attack on this pawn, and also we're stopping the white bishop from going able to f4. So that means we're going to take that pawn for free. White's best move would be pawn to e6, smashing our pawn structure because now taking back with the bishop is not as good. We're not really putting pressure on this pawn. And we might allow our opponent to play knight g5. Knight g5 will come with a threat on the bishop. You're gonna, you can't move the bishop away because knight f7 will win material for white. So you have to take with this pawn and keep the, the bishop pen on the board. So after the best move by white, which is h4, the idea of removing the knight from this very useful square, h5. Just stop that from happening. And after knight to g5, threatening knight f7, this is white playing the absolute best moves, computer moves. Black plays rook to d7 stopping that from happening. So after b4, how do you respond to this type of idea? I, it's very normal to feel under pressure when somebody starts pushing pawns. It's going to be against your king, but it's nothing to worry now. Black plays bishop e7, developing the idea of connecting the rooks. And after rook to c1, black plays knight to e5, knight c2, e5. That's why you just don't have to worry about, like, for example, b5 or any pawn storm, because we always have this available d3 square, right? Look, when you're done watching all of my Chigorin videos, you're going to know all the themes all the time. It's going to be so easy. So after bishop e2 now developing, because there's nowhere else to put the bishop, black plays rook h to d8, finishing development, and how can this be met? Well, if white plays, let's say, any move, I'll show you what incredible tactic is there. So if white plays c5, for example, b5 and then c6, Whatever, just going against our king, trying to dismantle the pawn structure. Black plays knight to h4. Boom. It's an incredible move. If white now, well, recaptures the knight, then you can play rook takes knight. Another sacrifice. Boom. Again, after this check, bishop moves. Then now the bishop is pinned in d2. So you can take this one with an attack on the bishop, double attack, and also an attack on the rook. So in this position, the white player will have to be careful to that. How does he stop it? Maybe g3 or maybe knight to f3. Let's look at g3. Well, knight to g4 would be enough because basically we're going to remove the bishop from that square e3, which is defending the knight, which is pinned, and then we're going to take, we're going to win a lot of material. Instead, if white plays knight to f3, take the knight, knight f3, check, and now obviously this knight cannot take back. We have double attack on the pawn in h4, so after the bishop takes back, then again, knight to h4. And you know what you're doing now. 
Because if you get to take this bishop, for example, pawn takes back, the knight is pinned. You can sacrifice the rook, bishop takes back, and then bishop g5. Pins all of that. And you're going to be winning material. You're going to go to the endgame with two bishops for a rook, which is winning. Two bishops win against everything. Rook c2 to protect the d2 square is not possible because you can take and then play rook d2 with the check defended by the bishop in g5 and then keep cleaning the board. And it's an easy win.